Why do we get pimples? It doesn't matter how many times you wash your face, you're almost certainly going to get some zits at some point in your life. As you turn into young teens, your body's going to overdrive, producing all kinds of new chemicals and hormones to help you grow. One of the ways your body goes into overdrive is by producing extra oil in the oil glands on your face. It might sound funny, but having oil on your skin is actually super important to keeping it healthy. But as your body grows, sometimes it produces uses more oil than it needs, which combines with dead skin and bacteria to clog your skin pores. We call those clogged pores pimples, zits, acne, blemishes, blackheads, whiteheads, and all sorts of other names. So if you wake up on the morning of school picture day with a big fat blemish right on the tip of your nose, don't freak out. The best thing you can do is wash regularly and avoid touching your face because this can spread the oil around and cause other breakouts. Oh, and one more thing that's a lot easier said than done, don't pop your pimples. I know, I know, it's almost impossible to resist, but according to skin doctors, you're better off letting pimples run their course naturally. Popping them can actually push the bacteria deeper into the skin, causing even more redness and irritation. What would happen if I never took another shower? Here's what would happen if you decided today that you were never going to shower again. Well, for starters, you'd stink. This one's pretty obvious, right? Dead skin, dirt, and all kinds of bacteria would slowly build up all over your body, causing an obnoxious odor. Is that not gross enough to get you in the shower? Well, how about brown clumps that would start growing on your skin? That's right, dirt, dust, or other disgusting microbes would slowly start to collect on your skin, causing brown growths. It's most likely to happen on parts of the body that produce the most natural oils. Your armpits, neck, head, and behind the ears. Dead skin wouldn't just build up on your body, your scalp would have all sorts of problems too. We call dead skin that collects on the scalp dandruff. It's a pretty common problem even for people who shower regularly, and it causes your head to itch. But if you stopped showering altogether, well, your dandruff would go into overdrive. Your hair would get oily and dirty, and would start to look matted and full of knots like unintentional dreadlocks. As if that wasn't bad enough, the skin on your face would have the worst acne attack of all time, giving you terrible pimples and pus bumps from all the oil buildup. But if just being really, really gross isn't enough to keep you showering, what about the effect it has on your health? <gasps> That's right, showers don't just keep you looking and smelling nice, they also keep you healthy. We're all taught that if we get a little scraper cut, it's best to wash it off. That's because dirt and bacteria can cause an infection. But if you never shower, getting a small cut is way more likely to get infected because of all the extra bacteria crawling around on your skin. So while it might be annoying to have a bath or shower regularly, it's way less annoying than losing a limb to infection. Have you ever stopped and wondered why we get gas in the first place? Unfortunately for us all, everything we eat and drink makes us fart. We pass gas about 20 times per day, and sometimes more. You see, every time we swallow food or slurp down a drink, we swallow a little bit of air with it. All that gas builds up inside our bodies and, well, has to come out one way or another. The air can come back out in the form of a burp, or, much more hilariously, as a fart. Okay, so pretty simple. We pass gas from our mouths or butts when we've swallowed too much air, but why do some stink and some don't? That has more to do with the bacteria in our guts. You see, the bacteria in your intestines help break down the food you eat. That process releases special gases that stink pretty bad. There are four basic types of sugar in food that cause a stinky reaction. The first is fructose, which is found in some tree fruits, berries, corn, sugarcane, and beets. The second is lactose, which is the sugars in milk and other dairy products that make them sweet. Third is raffinose, which is in beans, broccoli, asparagus, cabbage, and other vegetables. Last is sorbitol, which is found naturally in fruits and made artificially in corn syrup. 
Okay, so that's why some farts stink, but how about the noise? Why are some silent while others are quite loud? How loud a fart is depends on how much gas is built up, how fast it comes out, and how tightly you're clenching your, well, you know. If your muscles are more relaxed, you'll likely pass some quiet gas. But when you're trying not to fart and clenching up, the intense release causes all kinds of vibrations that can make it extra loud. What causes our nose to randomly bleed? Anyone who's ever had a nosebleed knows they're not very pleasant, but they're usually harmless and nothing to panic over. They tend to start in one nostril near the front of your nose, where blood vessels are smallest and closest to the surface of your skin. All that makes them more likely to break and bleed. There are lots of different reasons you can get a nosebleed. Believe it or not, picking your nose is actually a common cause. Getting up in there can accidentally cause a scratch from your nail that leads to a nosebleed. A physical injury like getting knocked in the nose or when you're young, sticking things up your nostrils can do it too. Even being sick with a stuffed up nose can start a nosebleed. All that tissue rubbing and nose blowing can lead to broken blood vessels and a bloody nose. The last major cause is all about overly dry air. When the air is extra dry, the inside of your nose dries up too and gets all cracked and irritated. If you ever get a nosebleed, don't panic. The best way to handle it is to either stand or sit up, grab some nearby tissues to soak up the blood, lean your head forward, and pinch your nose shut in a soft spot until you stop bleeding. It can take a couple of minutes for a nosebleed to stop, so be patient. But if it does last more than 20 minutes or so, it might be time to talk to a professional. You might feel tempted to tilt your head back when the blood starts flowing from your nostrils, but try to resist. It can cause the blood to run back into your throat, which can affect your breathing and might end up in your stomach. And unless you happen to be a vampire, swallowing blood isn't ideal. What would happen if you never brushed your teeth again? Believe it or not, throughout history, people have always found ways to brush their teeth even before the invention of the toothbrush. For instance, the ancient Egyptians made a terrible toothbrushing device by splitting the end of a twig and rubbing it on their teeth. Yeesh! Another popular method around the ancient world was dipping a rag in salt water and rubbing the teeth clean. In order to keep their mouths minty fresh, people in ancient China would sometimes chew on flavored twigs, kind of like a natural breath mint. <coughs> the Chinese were the first to invent the toothbrush over 1,000 years ago during the Tang Dynasty. It was made using the rough, bristly hairs on the back of a pig's neck and attaching them to a piece of bamboo or bone. Okay, so now that you know where the toothbrush came from, let's get right down to it. What would happen if you never brushed your teeth again? Whenever you eat, bacteria in your mouth breaks down the sugars left on your teeth from the food you ate. That sugar turns into an acid that damages the protective coating around your teeth called enamel. We call it a cavity whenever the acid rots a hole through that protective wall. Every time you brush your teeth, you're cleaning off the acid and protecting your teeth from cavities. If you don't brush your teeth, that acid will keep building up and up and up and form a yellow layer of bacteria called plaque on each tooth. Plaque can cause teeth to rot or even die if you don't make the effort to keep them clean. Think of it this way. When you watch a movie that takes place in the past, lots of times characters will have old, rotten, brown teeth. Well, that's what it looks like when someone goes their whole life without good oral hygiene. And it might look right on a medieval peasant, but trust me, you don't want to be going to class with brown teeth falling out of your mouth. What actually causes us to snore? Snores are big, deep noises that come out of our noses while we sleep. That can keep people nearby awake and, at worst, be loud enough to wake ourselves up or even wake someone up in another room. About half of us will snore at some point throughout our lives, so it's something you're likely gonna encounter one way or another. For some, snoring is a constant problem every night, and others just snore from time to time or very rarely. So what actually causes them? Well, you snore whenever air can't move easily through your nose and mouth while you sleep. 
If the air can't move freely out, it will burst out, kind of like a volcano of air from your nose, causing vibrations that make the classic snoring sound. There's all sorts of different things that can cause you to snore. Blocked airways or a stuffy nose are a common cause because they make it hard for air to flow naturally. Allergies, colds, or infections are often the cause of a night spent snoring. But you can also snore simply because of the way you're built. Guys have naturally narrower air passages than women, making them more likely to snore. Being overweight doesn't help either. Fat around the neck and throat can cut off air, leading to that terrible sound. Okay, so we know why we snore and what can cause it, but how do we avoid snoring altogether? If your nose is stuffed up, make sure to try and clear it out before bed. You can try some new sleeping positions too. Keep your head up about six or so inches while laying in bed with an extra pillow and try sleeping on your side instead of your back. This helps you breathe easier and will keep your nose from getting stuffed back up too fast if you're sick. Living healthy also helps a lot. Losing weight and exercising have both been shown to help people from snoring as often, and avoiding fatty foods and dairy right before bed can help too. And as annoying as snoring can be, it's hard to say if it's worth giving up that late night bowl of ice cream just to stop snoring. What would happen if you never slept again? The very first day after giving up on sleep might not go exactly as you'd expect. The lack of normal sleep will overstimulate your brain since it doesn't have a chance to rest and power down. As a result, the reward pathways in your brain will produce a chemical called dopamine that will make you feel good, awake, and full of energy. Off to a good start, huh? Well, enjoy that while it lasts because things are about to take a turn for the worse. First, your brain will conserve energy by shutting down the prefrontal cortex, the part that controls your impulses, reaction speed, and decision making. By the beginning of the second day, after two full nights without sleep, your brain and body will start powering down even more, and you might start to look pale and ill with deep, dark bags under your eyes. Two nights without sleep would take its toll on your immune system too, which would leave you much more vulnerable to catching a cold or flu. Day three without sleep is where things would really start to get weird. If you managed to make it three days without any sleep, it's almost certain you would start hallucinating as if your dreams are bleeding into the waking world. Ugh, trippy. Without sleep, it won't be too long before you actually die from exhaustion. Scientists don't know for sure exactly how long a healthy human can survive without sleep, but expert estimates suggest someone wouldn't last longer than a few months at best. The longest one person has ever been recorded going without sleep is a whopping 11 days, or over 260 hours. But here's the interesting thing. Even if you go that long without sleep, all it takes is about 12 hours of good, deep REM sleep to get you back on track with no long-lasting health effects. What's more dangerous is not getting sleep on a daily basis. Studies show that it puts you at risk of serious medical conditions like obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and even shortens your life expectancy. So yes, it might be annoying to go to bed when all you want to do is keep watching videos, but trust us, you're better off just getting some sleep. What actually causes us to puke? Right before you throw up, lots of things happen inside your body to prepare. Your mouth coats your teeth in saliva to protect them from the stomach acids in your puke. Usually, blood drains from your face as your body redirects it to your vital organs. And just as you're about to throw up, the muscles in your abs and diaphragm literally squeeze your stomach, forcing its icky contents back up your digestive tract to your throat and then your mouth. One of the main reasons we puke is to keep from being poisoned. Most animals eat small meals wherever they can find them. So if they do eat something poisonous, their body can usually fight it off before it kills them. But since humans eat such large portions in a single sitting, we're more likely to be poisoned. So when it comes to ingesting anything toxic, 
being able to puke can actually save your life. But it doesn't always have to be poison. If your stomach senses it's too full, or if you catch some sort of stomach bug like a flu, that can trigger vomiting too. Another common cause is motion sickness. Experts can't say for sure why this causes us to get nauseous and even puke, but they do have a leading theory. When our balance is thrown off, say after spinning around a bunch or riding on a wavy boat, our senses get confused and send the brain all kinds of mixed messages about what's going on, sending our body into emergency mode. And finally, puking isn't always caused by something physical. Our emotions can make us throw up too. We can vomit if we're overly scared, sad, or grossed out with something, or someone. So, why do we throw up? It turns out, for lots of different reasons. Just maybe take some precautions and decide on cotton candy after you ride the roller coaster. What did people use before toilet paper? Even before toilet paper was invented, people still needed to wipe themselves after going to the bathroom. And through the years, there have been all sorts of solutions to this ancient problem. The Romans used a tersorium. That's a fancy Roman name for, well, a sponge attached to the end of a stick that was shared by everyone. Yeah, not ideal. But that's not all. The stalls weren't very private. Romans had one long marble bench with several holes carved out, no walls or barriers between them. Sticks wrapped in cloth were used in parts of China as well. Around this time, paper was invented by the Chinese and eventually people started using bits of leftover paper instead. The very first known flushing toilet was invented in England in 1596 but it remained a royal luxury, and things didn't change all that much in the butt wiping department for a long time. In colonial America, British settlers colonizing North America often wiped with corn cobs before switching to old scraps of parchment. Toilet paper wasn't actually available to the masses for the first time until 1857, and even then, it wasn't quite as soft and strong as it is today. For the first few decades, people would often get little splinters from the loose, poor quality paper used at the time. In the last 50 or so years, there have been lots of innovations in toilet paper technology, leading to the ultra soft, absorbent, and strong stuff around today. So, next time your brother leaves the bathroom smelly and soiled when you gotta go, <laughs> just be glad you're not sharing a sponge on a stick. Do we really need to sweat? It sure stinks to get all sweaty, sometimes literally. But it turns out that sweating is actually a key part of helping regulate your body temperature. Everybody has two million sweat glands in their body. The only place with none are the lips. It might not seem like it, but your body is pretty much always sweating. You just don't notice it because it evaporates from your skin before enough builds up to make a bead of sweat. When your body starts to get too warm, your brain sends signals to those two million sweat glands telling them to release sweat from your pores. When that sweat evaporates on your skin, it takes some of the heat with it and helps cool you down. But when your body is extra hot, like after exercise or on a humid summer day, that sweat builds up faster than it can evaporate. Most of us don't really like to sweat. It's wet, sticky, stinky, and uncomfortable. But despite all that, you should be happy you sweat. Without sweat to help cool you down, your body would overheat, which can make you really sick or even kill you. <coughs> okay, so that's why we sweat, to help us stay cool. But why is our sweat salty? Well, sweat is mostly made up of good old-fashioned water, but there's also trace amounts of other things in there too. Chemicals, sugars, and salts. These all make their way into your body and eventually work their way into your sweat glands. Your body filters out most of that salt from your sweat, but enough gets through to give sweat that trademark salty taste. Mmm, now I want french fries. Is that weird? 